Okay, so I feel like I am the luckiest and happiest corpus callosum, <laughs> <laughs> separating and breaching these two gentlemen, <laughs> Ima Gilchrist and Rupert Sheldrake. I've had the honor and pleasure to spend many hours in conversation with you two, and we're here at Rupert's house because um, we've recorded a series of conversations with Rupert and also with Ian, and um, the last one covering his book, The Matter With Things. And so we couldn't miss this opportunity to be the three of us, and especially you two in conversation. Mm. So I'm, I'm really glad we're doing this. So am I. <laughs> mm, <laughs> you too. <laughs> so uh, let's start with any curiosity back and forth, maybe from Rupert, yeah. apropos of the hemisphere hypothesis, and perhaps from Ian, apropos of morphic resonance, and then see where we go. Mm. All right. Well, Ian, I confess I haven't read the whole of your book. Um, but I've read several chapters Very of it, and I've <laughs> watched many of your talks and so on. Yeah. And one thing I deduced is that it's something to do with the two hemispheres of the brain. Um, that has come through quite loud and clear <laughs> on, uh, in every chapter. And I've, there, are, there are two things I'm curious about, about the hemispheres mm. and mm. your chosen central terrain. Mm. Um, one is that when people started doing these split brain operations they were done I think for epileptics mainly weren't they they, they severed Correct. the corpus callosum that joins the two halves of the brain together yes. um, and this enabled Sperry and other scientists to look at the lateralization of function in the two hemispheres and they had to do very sophisticated experiments to show this that all that is leads to this idea of differentiated function but the bit that interests me um, um, is that they were doing these operations on, on patients who had their brain split in two, or at least all down to, there were still a few connections mm. in the basal brain, but largely severed the connections mm. between them. And the reason they were able to get do this and go on doing it was because when people went home, it seemed to have solved the seizure problem. and. They seem perfectly normal. Mm. And for me, that's the most astonishing thing yes. of all in this research, that people who'd had their brain completely cut in two, not completely, but largely cut in two, would coordinate the movements of both sides of their body, their move, mouth, mouth moved coordinatedly as they spoke, mm. their mm. spouses and loved ones hardly noticed any difference. Yeah, right. And for me, that suggests either that the nervous connections to, to the two halves of the brain are complete or largely unnecessary, which is very surprising, um, uh, or that the, and or that the um, coordination between the two halves of the brain, which must be there in order to walk and speak and swim and dance and do all the normal movements of life. Mm, I'm mm. just talking about motor coordination here, mm, not just mm. about you know, the more sophisticated cognitive functions. That uh, then there must be still some coordination to the halves, two halves of the brain, and for me that suggests there's a kind of resonance between the two halves of the brain resonate either electromagnetically or through something like morphic resonance. That there's an overall wholeness within which these two parts are coordinated by resonance, if they're not coordinated by direct nervous connections, as one might otherwise have assumed. So for me, it raises a completely different view of how the brain may actually work and how the two hemispheres may be coordinated. So what, what would you think about that? I mean, why is mm. it that sever severing the connection of corpus callosum that links the two halves has so little manifest effect? Well, the first thing to say is that the corpus callosum, many people don't realize, is a mammalian invention. So although uh, reptiles, amphibians and many other creatures lower down that tree um, have two centers in their brain, they're not connected in this direct way. The corpus callosum started with the first mammals. The second thing I think that's worth reflecting on is that it's uh, not uncommon for people to be born with what's called colossal agenesis, in other words, they don't have a corpus callosum, and it's often a chance finding at post mortem. 
So quite clearly, um, the finding that you can sever the connection and people can lead a reasonably normal life, um, almost impossible really to, if, if casually encountered, you wouldn't notice that there was a problem. Th th these are consonant findings and they are a bit mysterious, uh, I agree. Um, but what they think they show is that, first of all, uh, this, this direct connection between the hemispheres is not the only way in which the two hemispheres can communicate. Hmm. Um, for example, they, they very obviously share a body and the eyes and the senses take in both parts of the body so they know, as it were, if you like, they can sense outwardly as well as inwardly what's going on. Um, the, mostly in these cases, uh, the operation was done in somebody who had a longish life and had got used to the coordination of the two hemispheres. They, they uh, communicate with one another through the endocrine system. There are all sorts of ways in which they, they, they have a common um, internal environment. Um, and as you say, they communicate at the level of the brain stem and, and even a little bit above it. So there is definitely connection there of a kind. I don't know quite how to understand the resonance though, because the immediate question is, I mean, when you think of things resonating, you think the brain waves from this hemisphere, are they literally resonating with the other hemisphere? I don't know of any evidence of that. So what sort of a resonance exactly is it that they might have? Well, I'm not sure, but I, what I'd think of is say that there was a, a field morphic field covering the whole brain and brain activity that included within it the activity of the two hemispheres then the way in which they're coordinated might be through this field coordinating the two parts uh, within a larger whole and the coordination wouldn't necessarily mean that one echoes the other in a most literal resonance no. way but the way in which say the different organs of a body or say different atoms within a molecule are coordinated within mm. a larger field. Mm. Now, if you take a, a molecule like a very simple molecule like H2O or CO2, the, the, the atoms, the carbon and the two oxygens in carbon dioxide, are bound together by bonds, but the bonds that bind them together have an electron cloud that goes around the whole molecule. Yes. Covalently bonded molecules have a cloud of electrons surrounding the whole molecule, like yes. a membrane around the whole molecule. Yes. And the bond between the actual individual atoms is, is, is there are shared electrons that bond them. Yes. But the, there's a, a cloud, an yes. electron cloud around the whole thing. And the vibratory patterns of carbon and oxygen within the CO2, they have different vibratory patterns, but they're coordinated together by an overall field which influences both Yes. through its influence on their vibratory frequencies and coordinates them and is sensitive to changes in both in a way that communicates it to the other. Yes. Something like that. I mean, this is a crude model and, mm. and I haven't actually tried to work it out in detail. But some overarching field of whatever kind, I mean, my favorite yes. kind of morphic fields, but yes. some overarching organizing yes. field yes. in which both are parts and which coordinates the two would seem to me to be uh, one way of thinking about this. Well, immediately, of course, I think of the way in which <coughs> quantum field theory suggests that the way we tend to think in terms of little balls or particles is uh, at most of metaphorical meaning, and that what is being referred to there is a very particular state of something that is an overall field of that is that has energy and exerts influence so such fields are very basic and without the idea that there is some sort of coordinating field it's difficult to explain how a simple organism uh, a single celled organism can detect uh, changes and respond to them in other parts of of even that cell i mean this is something that has been puzzled over Mm. by many biologists mm. um, and there seems to be some overall coordination and of course this 
goes much further when you come to a multicellular organism and how do the various parts of this organism know that certain things need to be responded to elsewhere in the organism because we know we don't at the moment have any way of understanding how this communication takes place yes you see i think it even uh, applies to physical systems like crystals i mean there's a long-standing problem as you know with snowflakes you know, yeah. Johannes Kepler wrote a monograph on the six-sided snowflake. I didn't, actually. Oh, he no. did, yes. He was fascinated by mm. snowflakes. Yes. And all these people have taken wonderful pictures of snowflakes. Yes. You know, Bentley uh, yes. is one of the great ones, uh, the, the classic pictures. What you see with the snowflake is they all have six yes. sides yes. or arms. And the six arms are the same as each other. I know. But each snowflake is different. Exactly. So... The thing is, how come that mm. they're coordinated? Because you could say, well, the particular branches on a thing are random to do with the immediate environment. Mm. But then you'd have to say, to explain the whole snowflake being the same, the, every arm of the growing snowflake was exactly the same on that snowflake. And they're all, they're all the same just because they were in exactly the same fluctuating environment, fluctuating the same way. Yeah. Uh, and the next snowflake was in a completely different environment. Yeah. Or you could say, as I, uh, intriguingly, the late editor of Nature, Sir John Maddox, who was no <laughs> friend of mine in many ways, uh, uh, puzzling over this question of snowflakes, mm. uh, said there must be some kind mm. of internal resonance within the lattice structure of the snowflake that uh, enables it to be coordinated. You must have been reading you. <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you see, there, there, there are resonances within crystal lattices, there, yes. there are resonant patterns and harmonics and stuff. Um, and so, say there's a coordination between these seemingly separate yes. arms of the snowflake, yes. which could depend on some kind of field that's over and above the individual arms. Yes. So that's the kind of model. Yes. And yes. It, one would expect, with any holistic model of organisms, that there's a, a field for the entire body that helps mm. coordinate mm. the development mm. of the body and all the organs within it. Yes. But the, this field also helps coordinate development of, of different parts. Yes. So, for example, mm. when the fingerprint patterns are similar on right and left hands, uh, left hands, and when the right and the left hand side of the faces are similar, they're not exactly the same, of course. No. But I think in normal morphogenesis, there's a kind of right-left resonance going mm -hmm. on all the time, mm -hmm. which helps coordinate bilaterally symmetrical structures. Yes. Now, of course, the brain's not exactly bilaterally symmetrical, is one of the points yes. that we know from yes. its anatomy as well as its function. Yes. But some overarching field that enables this to happen. That, to me, is why one reason I myself got interested in split brains, and it's mm. the opposite yes. from your own interest, which is about the differences. And I, I was just interested in how come the coordination is still so remarkable and so integrated that we don't experience two, most people don't experience two sub-personalities all the time. And the idea of a coordinating field that includes and, and uh, both and uh, coordinates both yes. would help to explain why we don't go around with, you know, right-hand Rupert and left-hand Rupert, and go, one with a wonderfully integrated view of the world and the other with a kind of obsessively yes. literal one. Yeah. Is your yes, question perhaps rephrased by saying, is there an organizing principle that unites the master and his emissary? <laughs> or can yes. the master do it on its own? No, I think, well, one way of thinking about what you're talking about is that just as in the developing organism there needs to be differentiation so that on one part side of the body there'll be a liver and on the other you know what, spleen and so on Th these things are also part of a single overarching field yes. if you like um, and the brain could be seen as similarly asymmetrical but part of an o that asymmetry is already yes. part of a of a single field I think you must have been reading McGilchrist, actually, because, of course, I have, I have wonderful uh, images of snowflakes, actually, and, and talk about exactly this this issue, oh. uh, which also occurs in deer antlers, for example. Yes. Deer antlers have a particular form peculiar to that deer. If you cut them off, they regenerate exactly according to that pattern. But where this pattern is stored is not known. 
Um, so overall, we have uh, problems that are generally neglected because they're difficult to answer. But uh, as soon as you start thinking about it in a more inquiring way, which I would have thought was the point of science, ask difficult questions. Mm. How is it that these things have this overall cohesion? And we know, for example, you know, in the brain, um, I forget the exact figure, but it's something staggering, like 500,000 neurons are generated every minute in the, in the business of gestation in the womb. And all those uh, neurons have to end up precisely in the right place in the brain. And the brain has minute architectural... Where exactly is this information stored mm. about the three-dimensional structure alone mm. of the brain? I don't think it can be even encoded in simple linear code in the sense that we think of code. Of course, we've now uh, dropped the idea that it's at all a linear code in the way the computer is coded, but instead must be a three-dimensional code. And so we know about the conformation in epigenetics of, of different um, mm. uh, of the genes involved. But nonetheless, where is this? You don't see anywhere in that this intricate three-dimensional. Um, structure stored and the simplest thing I can imagine is that there is some overarching field. Uh, yes. Can I just add a couple of other amusing or interesting things? I mean w one is the striking fact that um, the people who are born without limbs nonetheless have the sense of the limbs. They never had them but nonetheless they, they have an internal sense of those limbs and um, Ramachandran describes a woman who had um, uh, no limb, no upper limbs, having phantom limbs which she couldn't stop gesticulating when she talked. So this uh, part of evolutionary history that the hand movements are coordinated with speech was there in her although she had never experienced hands or arms. The other thing which is raised by um, uh, F.S.C. Schiller, the, the uh, Victorian philosopher, Oxford philosopher, uh, which is a, a very good point is um, we know of course that when people have damage to one part of the brain other parts of the brain can take over the function. But how is this coordinated? How does one part of the brain that's supposedly doing whatever it does know we need speech? How are we going to get it back? I mean, in a way, there's a, there's a need for something overarching to draw out that function in a new place in the brain. Hmm. Well, of course, my own starting point for my ideas on morphic resonance was morphogenetic fields, form-shaping fields. And I started my scientific career working on plant development. Yes. And the, how is it that leaves and flowers and, and stamens and so on develop? And the idea of morphogenetic fields, first put forward in the 1920s, um, was exactly that of a coordinating field that, that uh, uh, brings forth these patterns mm. um, and underlies regeneration. Yes. And so, for example, in, in the... Um, regeneration of salamander eyes, so-called uh, Wolfian regeneration. Mm -hmm. um, you cut out the lens of the eye of a newt or a salamander and it will regenerate a new lens from the edge of the iris, which is not how the lens forms in the embryo. It forms by folding in of skin from the outside. So there's a completely uh, f filling a missing structure by um, modifying some other structure would never normally be modified exactly. to, to create, to fill that function. So, and this, all this similar kind of coordination applies in social insects. If you remove some of the workers or remove some of the soldiers or, or remove some of the hive or something, the, the whole system readjusts some of them, stop, they stop doing what they're doing, some of them take on different functions and roles. Yeah. So these coordinating fields I think uh, 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 underlie all of biology, actually all of nature, of self-organizing systems. Mm. And phantom limbs are particularly interesting because I think in a phantom limb, the phantom is the field of the limb which is experienced from within, mm. uh, but which doesn't have a material structure associated okay. with it. And as you may know, one of the experiments uh, that I proposed in my book, Seven Experiments That mm. Could Change the World, is on detecting phantom limbs. I recruit amputees 
through veterans organizations, tried recruiting them through hospitals, but they were extremely uncooperative. <laughs> um, um, but, uh, and then I have the phantom uh, amputee, but they push their phantom arm through one of six positions in a barrier, a door, for example. And on the other side, uh, that's, uh, um, that's done in a randomized sequence. On the other side, I have people who do subtle energy medicine, Reiki, healers, and so on. And one at a time, I lead them in, I say, one of those panels has a phantom arm sticking through it, um, and the others don't, which has got the phantom, and they sort of feel in the different places. And they say, that one. And they are right more than chance so far, substantially more than chance. Mm. So um, the main objection I've had to this is, well, how do you know it's not just telepathy? <laughs> so I think, well, if we've moved, if the sceptical <laughs> argument says it's it, it, could, it must be telepathy, yeah. and we've moved the That's argument beautiful. forward. But, yes, yes. But then, to, yeah. as a test for that, mm -hmm. I haven't done this yet, but the control, the telepathy control is, you ask them to imagine pushing their phantom yes. arm through, yes. or you ask them to extend their phantom arm, but step back, uh, a yard or two to start with and extend it so it doesn't actually go through the door and yes, so that yes. would be another control yes now that yes. these experiments are not expensive uh, yeah, um, yeah. Um, in fact they're free yes um, yes but the so i think that actually this whole question can be taken much further yes it's just, this is not the kind of thing people do in in labs yeah, at the moment but yeah. it, they could yes. uh, but i I, before we leave the subject of the split, the divided yes, brain, yes. and and all that, um, I have a more uh, probably a simpler, easier to answer question. You could probably refer me to page three thousand and twenty-seven <laughs> in your magnum <laughs> office, um, uh, <laughs> which is um, uh, I'm a pianist, mm, and uh, mm. and so obviously playing the piano involves coordinating the right and yeah. the left hand, yeah. and the left hand, which which mainly does the rhythmic section, as yes, it were, yes. is clearly controlled by the right brain. Yes. And, and the right hand, which does the sort of melody and all the yes. rest, is by the left brain. Yes. And in playing the piano, these are coordinated. Yeah. Um, and how does this map on to your interpretation? I'm sure it maps wonderfully well, but uh, I'd just love to know how. Well, one of the mysteries is that um, music is abnormally lateralized in the brain of performers. So in the general population who are not professional musicians or full-time musicians, um, the only bit of music that is really understood or, or interpreted by the left hemisphere is rhythm. And uh, melody and harmony are almost exclusively um, understood and experienced in the right hemisphere. So uh, that seems, on the face of it, very different from what you're describing. And one of the yes. things, one of the things, is that um, it, for most instruments, um, the, the two hands need to be coordinated for all these activities. And so, when you look at professional musicians, what I've just described is not the case. So they have developed a left hemisphere which is also capable of understanding melody and harmony. Um, and the right hemisphere already actually understands rhythm anyway. In fact, complex rhythms in the ordinary person are understood by the right hemisphere, not by the left. It's only simple rhythms the left can get. Um, the sort of thing that I constantly hear everywhere I go, blaring out of cars on speakers in shops and so on, which is just boom, boom, boom. That is the left hemisphere speaking. Hmm. Um, but well, I think what you're describing is is an effortful coordination which actually modifies the brain. Hmm. I see, because you see, I thought on the basic, I mean, my understanding of McGilchrist 101 was that actually the right and left hand should be reversed, and there's no reason why in when the development of piano playing took place the keyboards shouldn't have been the other way round. Hmm. Well, with, with the deep notes at the top. Yes, the, the, well, yes. yes, with the, the keyboard reversed, so you yes. play the, with the left hemisphere, the right hand would do the rhythm, and the left hand would do the... I mean, it could have been exactly the mirror image of the way it is now. There's nothing in the technology that says it has to be that way around. It's quite right. Uh, I never really thought about that. I think that you'd have to have had not just a, a reversal um, of... You'd have to have had the higher notes on the left hand part yes. of the scale. Yes. That's right. I, the, the thing is that in the brain there are certain things that are um, positionally 
it, it seems like, for example, the sequence from left to right in which things grow is 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 innate in, for example, chicks. They tend to see the, the thing, a series of numbers grows as you move towards the right, which is the way in which we see from one to so. And so uh, we we start from lower to higher, and it may be that this is also the way in which it seems fundamentally that the the lower notes are, are basic. Uh, <laughs> They are the base, and that the, the other is what is built more complexly on top of it, and so it may be natural that an instrument developed in this way. But I haven't studied all instruments around the world to see whether or not uh, there's a project um, for somebody well, yes. with nothing else to do. Well, look at Islamic music. You see, because they read from right to left, yes, and so their whole way, sense of the way things develop. Yes, you start at the back of the book by our criteria, and you. You read from right to left; it's the exact opposite. Of course, if 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 pianos had first been developed in the Caliphate or in Baghdad or somewhere, <laughs> uh, perhaps the uh, the upper part of the keyboard would have been the lower notes and yes. the rhythm section, and, and it would might have been a mirror image of existing pianos. It's a hypothetical, but some research, anthropological research, would be interesting. Mm. Yes, I, I don't know why why it's ended up that way. In brief, but that is the way it is. And it's also true, of course, of um, of all instruments. I don't know of any instruments that are just played with one hand. I mean, it's one of the things we do, even with sort of uh, playing a flute, playing a violin. Both hands have to be coordinated, at least in Western music. That is a, almost a sine qua non. So um, the, the hands have to work together in this way, and the brain is modified in those who do it so that it can. I wonder how much learning the piano, you see, I started learning piano when I was five, I come from a yes. musical family, Yes. and my son Merlin learned at five, Cosmo started learning at four, and that means from a very early age, um, I and they and lots and lots of other people yes. have actually been using brains in a way that would be somewhat counterintuitive if they yeah. read McGilchrist first, and it, so... Um, so this is, uh, does this affect the actual development of people? Do people who learn the piano or other instruments at an early age develop differently? I mean, uh, professional musicians, you said, are noticeably different, but what about amateur musicians who play every day? So well, of course, the, the distinction is not between amateur and professional, but between people who are constantly playing and those who are only occasionally playing. Yes. Um, so I don't think there's a problem with that. Um, but I would imagine that starting early to learn an instrument like this will modify, certainly we know in respect of the appreciation of sound that it does modify the brain, and I don't see why it should not modify the brain in other ways. You and your two sons uh, have interesting brains that work perhaps slightly differently from the standard Western brain. <laughs> mm. Yes. Yes, well, uh, no, that's a really interesting possibility, isn't it? And I don't know if anybody's done more tests on on professional pianists, or, or you know, uh, I don't know of any. No, well, it would be a good research area from the point of view of brain yes. naturalization, mm -hmm. wouldn't Absolutely it? Absolutely would. But I have seen p reports saying that people who learn the piano or other instruments have a different way in which they think and stuff. I okay. mean, I, I, I mean, but it would be an obvious thing to do because this, this involves a close coordination of the two hemispheres yes. in, in, in a way that... Yes. Is, I mean, we need it in every physical activity, walking, running, jumping, sports skills, presumably, yes, yes. you know, playing cricket, playing yes, football, yes, etc., yes. right and left feet. Presumably all these physical skills involve coordination of hemispheres. Well, they do, but the difference is that the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere in motor performance, we each control the other, and there's not the, you know, uh, there's the distinction that there is between melody, harmony, and rhythm, if you see what yes. I mean. So uh, music introduces a whole different aspect. Yes. Mm. There's, there's no reason to suppose that we should be discoordinated when we move. Mm. Uh, and mm. animals that have no corpus callosum are perfectly well coordinated. Mm. Mm. You know, this question of yours could be scaled up to in asking how could we nurture young brains so that they have an easier time to um, grasp the world as you've proposed in your book, or another way to put it would be 
um, how to nurture the Ruperts and Ians of the future, <laughs> which is something I'm very concerned with. Mm, mm. Um, what can we do to facilitate those intuitions that you both have been pursuing in different ways, but, but scientifically and, and beyond? I don't know if you have some thoughts on that. Well, one, th uh, one thought I have that seems relevant is that I think that um, to the extent that what you're asking for is people who think more flexibly, um, there is a problem with dogma in both in philosophy and in science. It's a natural tendency for things to ossify, to fix prematurely mm. and not allow evolution. Uh, it's natural for thought to evolve and to do this it has to be creative and it, the best um, kinds of thinking that will allow this are those in which analytic uh, acumen is there but coupled with rather like the left and the right hand coupled with um, a more imaginative and intuitive way of thinking and I, mean, I describe the the uh, insights of many scientists and mathematicians and it's quite extraordinary how virtually all of them describe this so-called aha moment as being the creative thing that reveals the new gestalt and this aha moment is robustly associated with the superior temporal gyrus and sulcus of the right hemisphere. So we know that this is right hemisphere mediated. And the trouble with our education now is that it's very much technically orientated. More and more we're saying what's the point in teaching people unless it's teaching them some mechanical skill that will be useful to them. But in fact, the point of um, uh, an education is to draw out of us our humanity, and humanity used to be part of what we discussed uh, in school, the humanities. Mm. And I think that um, a greater emphasis on music, on poetry, which also um, involves very largely the right hemisphere, whereas ordinary discursive language is probably more dependent on the left hemisphere than on both, uh, that these ways of thinking should be part of the way we educate children. Mm. What do you say, Rupert? Yes. Well, I, th I think that the, 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 there are some forms of education, like sports, physical skills, crafts, which are part of education. I mean, they're always being squeezed out by this emphasis yes. on yeah. more science, more literacy, more language, more learning. And yes. Um, I think training, well, training other skills like intuitive abilities and uh, emotional uh, intelligence, all these things, they seem to me really important. But we've got a, a system of education which is designed for, well, basically it follows from a kind of Victorian design, doesn't it, of preparing people for life in a, an industrial society. Yeah. Uh, one thing is to make children used to getting up and showing up for school at nine o'clock in the morning yeah. and and uh, fixed hours, I mean, which mm. you need in an industrial society. You do. Disciplining from an early age. Yes. And uh, I think a lot of it's about that. Well, um, I think that's very important myself. Well, it is important, but it's, 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 it's not primarily about creativity. No, um, and obviously Actually, so. for most people, I don't think creativity is that. I don't think we necessarily need to have creativity built into the entire educational system. No, absolutely it's a not, major not disadvantage. Hmm. It's a disadvantage for a lot of people to be creative. I mean, if you've got a regular job and you're creative, <laughs> you're going to have an awfully <laughs> difficult time. Um, and you, you, there's, most jobs require a lack of creativity. Yes. Um, and, you know, I went into the, the science, uh, scientific career believing that the importance of science was to be original and creative. And I soon discovered there was every obstacle to, to yeah. doing that. Yeah. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've found, whenever I'm trying to be or am being or, yeah. you know, doing something that seems to me original and creative, yeah. instead of people saying how oh, wonderful, I mean, the vast majority of people <laughs> say rubbish, nonsense, where's the evidence, etc. And if you have the evidence and you do an experiment you think is creative, they say, well, you've got these results, but where's the theory? You know, um, <laughs> and, and uh, you know, so, <laughs> um, and as, as, as Alex sometimes says, you know, one of the responses I get to my 
research on telepathy and things like that is you know it's all very well in practice but does it work yeah, in theory yeah, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> no, I, I, I so know that. actually originality is a major disadvantage for a lot of people well it might creativity. Be, but it depends what we mean uh, by an education if we mean simply preparing people for routine jobs then we're limiting their potential and we're prescribing what is valued in society whereas if we were to encourage some people definitely need their originality um, enhancing or, or not even enhancing but liberating I think it's there mm. in a lot of people but it does need disciplining as well this is why I see that both parts are important I think that modern education both lacks discipline and lacks originality. It's mm -hmm. about sticking information mm -hmm. into people inefficiently and then hoping they can regurgitate it later. But that's not an education at all. An yeah. education is, is about enabling something that is innate to, to, to grow. But that growth also, if you like, needs a, f a formal field in which to grow. Mm -hmm. And that should be provided by good teachers and was, I hope for you, and certainly was mm -hmm. for me, mm -hmm. by um, uh, highly disciplined, uh, intellectually acute, but also imaginatively inspired teachers mm. from whom I learned. You know, this was yes. extraordinarily important. No, I was very lucky too mm. with my teachers yes. at school and at university. Yes. Mm. But I, I mean, what I want to emphasize is it's not about letting it all hang out. Mm. I mean, mm. there was an enormous amount of discipline. You know, at an early age, one had to know trigonometry and calculus. One had to be able to understand Greek grammar and Latin grammar, all these things. Mm. And, and th these are difficult. I mean, mm. they're not things that you get by sort of going, oh, well, whatever. I mean, they really require serious application. Mm. So one does need that structure. And I'm, I, you know, I believe that in the learning a, a, a skill, and you talked about that, and I think, you know, and you're talking about manual skills largely. Mm -hmm. I think they're very important crafts and skills. Mm -hmm. But to begin with, you have to do rather laborious copying of things. But then mm -hmm. the, you are in the position to be able to go further than that. Mm -hmm. But you need that first element to be there before you can go further. Mm -hmm. I mean, I didn't write this book out of not knowing anything about neuroscience yeah. or you know, and there was years of hard work involved. Yes. Yeah. And your work it also involves years of hard work, I know. Mm. It's that commute from right to left to right that you mentioned, right? Yes, it needs mm. to go from right to left and back to right, by mm. which I mean that one's first apprehension of something is is mm. a perceptive and imaginative understanding, and then one needs to, as it were, learn more by the process of analysis and seeing the, the structure of what one's doing and making comparisons and putting things together in a certain way. But the, it must never stop there. That is an intermediary phase, and the, then it needs to be reintegrated into a new whole in which those that laborious analysis has been not lost because that suggests that it was pointless but it had its point at a certain po period in time hmm. Hmm. what you're discussing reminds me of the simple organisms i used to study e coli mm -hmm. how they navigate the world okay and it's like learning to tumble and learning to run they need to run and tumble so in a way a certain dose of dogmatism is needed to just keep on going, going. for some for some while because yes. you would stop at every point yes. to yes. reconsider you would get nowhere yes. but if you don't stop and tumble then you just you also go nowhere so it's it's this balance in so a way it's very interesting mm. and of course science needs um to balance its openness to change and newness and its willingness to stick to certain things unless there's a good reason for moving on otherwise it would be changing its mind about everything all the time so as everything in life is a matter of balancing things and coming to a position which honors and respects and enhances by integrating the two things that we think of as separate in some way but mm. they're not really separate mm. Mm. No, i agree mm. Now, let's not make of your particular biographies, as a friend of mine says, a, a, a universal category, but I'd like to hear a bit about your own paths, because it's clear that you've gone through the margins, or the edge, you could even say cutting edge. You haven't followed the prescribed path at your risk, mm, and mm. you su su succeeded. And that's why maybe we don't have here other people who didn't make it, but you've, you've made it. And in a way, your paths yes. are similar in that respect. Yeah, and what does that tell us as a, as a model, or what did it doesn't tell us as a model for other people? Well, I mean, I suppose we're both feral academics. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. And we were both fellows of colleges at, you know, at Oxford, near Cambridge. And uh, 
we somehow escaped from domestication <laughs> and, and, uh, and lived in the wild. I, I mean, I did as much in the wild as you. I mean, you retreated to a wild, the fastnesses of, of the Western Isles. Um, I'm merely on the edge of Hampstead Heath. <laughs> um, yes. But I find, I don't know if you do, that very often now, and I don't think this was always the case, but very often now, um, the, the really interesting ideas are coming forth from places that are not in the middle of the mainstream. They're coming from people who are working on their own or working in small groups, and these are producing highly interesting and imaginative propositions. Whereas in the mainstream, there's far too much emphasis on not stepping out of line, not rocking the boat, not... I mean, if you say something that isn't what, what your colleagues are saying, then you won't get promoted, you won't get a grant and all the rest. Mm. So it, it must be deadening, actually, living like that. And I'm just not prepared to live like that. And I don't expect you were either. No. No. Um... But it does. I mean, it's not a, a career path one can recommend to other no, people because not it's to, not, not very well. easy to survive no, no. outside the framework of regular salaries. Yes. You see, Alex is a uniquely privileged being Spanish, <laughs> uh, with, in a way that we can't be being British. Yes. Because being a scientist in Spain is to be part of the civil service. Yes. And once you've got tenure, as he has, uh, then you've got it for life. And, and uh, so he can do what he likes. <laughs> yes. So he's in the uniquely privileged position of having an actual salary, which neither or you or I have no, had for a very no. long time, um, um, and uh, the freedom to be inquiring into all these things and talking to you and me and, and investigating all sorts of areas of science. Well, that's a very with a remarkable very freedom. Good model. Two caveats um, here. Yes. <laughs> One is once you got tenure. That's yes, one caveat. Yes, yes, yes. And what has happened to those who didn't get it yes, and were yes, perhaps yes. more valuable? And also those who got it, how the, the whole process has shaped their minds? That's one thing. And the second paradox is I have many colleagues who got tenure, but yeah. they they continue. I mean, probably they some of them may want to continue doing what they're doing, but even having tenure. Like yes, some people yes. say, I'll wait until I retire. Yes. And then I'll write that book or I put yes, that idea. Yes. And perhaps that's also a good idea to do it later, but maybe it's too late. Maybe, I maybe don't it's know. too late often. I so think. it doesn't yes. guarantee. One, yes. you need to get to tenure, and even if you get there, it, it's no guarantee for anything of that well, No, it doesn't guarantee people will take you seriously. I mean, even, you know, you, I used to think that people who got the Nobel Prize would have enough confidence mm. to do and say what they think and would be taken seriously. But actually, even the Nobel Prize is no guarantee. Mm. Brian Josephson, for example, yes, at yeah. Cambridge, yes. well, as soon as he got interests in psychic phenomena yes, and the yes. nature of consciousness, yes. um, although he's a professor with tenure, yes. as a Nobel laureate, a fellow of Trinity College, yes. you know, his colleagues are you know, mm. make sure he doesn't get students and <laughs> that he's marginalized etc because yeah. th his views are untenable in their eyes mm. so so even a nobel prize and tenure right. doesn't it, it may guarantee a certain freedom of maneuver but it doesn't guarantee that what one does will have much influence um, the influence is perhaps another matter but i i haven't found that I mean, largely being in the mainstream most of my life has impeded me. I mean, because I was, you know, I was a fellow of an Oxford College and I became a, a psychiatrist and director at the Bethlehem and Morsley Hospital in London, which is, of all the institutions of mental health, one of the most, you know, central in the world. But, you know, and I was salaried, um, but of course, there was freedom to to use what one saw and think in another way, and I think it's open to more people than one thinks. They don't have to go out completely on a limb. But if you look at what you experience and think about it in a deeper, broader context, you see something different. And I just think that an awful lot of people see what they're doing in science as sort of self-evident and not uh, not not raising further questions. It's, it's a rather unusual kind of mind that, that asks the question, so why does it actually do that? Why does it work like that? And, and I you know, have found one of the best books um, on this topic is uh, Erwin Chargaff's um, autobiography, Heraclitean Fire. 
And, you know, he was a very great, um, honoured biochemist at Yale who laid the groundwork for Crick and Watson and so on, um, the author of Chargaff's Rules. But he writes brilliantly and with enormous imagination about what he sees science to be. And he contrasts it with this extremely deadening, um, simple following out of linear paths. I think it's partly a result of the massive expansion and professionalization of exactly. science. I mean, since he the Second World exactly. War, yes, yeah. Yeah. it becomes a career path. Yes. And yeah. It was a struggle. In the 19th century, a lot of scientists in Britain were either amateurs, yes. like Charles Darwin, who yes. never had yes. an academic or job. Faraday, or you know, Faraday. Faraday was at the Royal Institution, not in a university, yes. in a rather eccentric, small institution. Yes, yes. And so, uh, but when it became professionalised, uh, something that T. H. Huxley was one of the drivers of in Britain, you know, to make science a professional, like a priesthood, yes. um, where only people who got the right degrees and yes. qualifications yes. could teach it and yes. influence yes. people through universities yes. and yes. the school system and what was taught in schools and all yes. that was professionalised. Mm. And then you've got to have the right qualifications. His aim was to squeeze out country vicars who did yeah. wonderful natural history they did. who believed in God. He thought yeah. no one in science should believe in God yes. or if they did it should be kept you've at least very much their private life. You can't have two priesthoods. Hmm. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> you, 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 can, you have one priesthood and, yeah. and then this model of scientists as priests then spread to, you know, in the Soviet Union, scientists were the highest rank of the intellectuals and all that kind of thing. And, hmm. and so it became all over the world, and you know, in countries like India and China, engineers mm. and scientists have mm. very, very high prestige. Mm. They're not terribly high prestige in Britain because they're regarded as boffins and <laughs> geeks and things. And you know, <laughs> the highest prestige goes to people who've been to Eton and Oxford and who <laughs> belong to the Bollinger Club and become <laughs> conservative prime ministers at least for a while. Um, they, so the, the, I don't the, know that the person you're referring to currently enjoys great esteem in the country. No, no, <laughs> it's, it's only temporary. <laughs> it uh, shows these things are always temporary. Well. But still, the mm. point is that in, in Britain, scientists have never commanded, I mean, mm. Newton's been venerated and Darwin's mm. been venerated mm. and so on, but it's never been like this, quite the priesthood level that it mm. achieves in many other countries. No, no. Um, but nevertheless, it's the idea is of a kind of priesthood, and then mm. you've got then all the ranks of the sort of deacons and subdeacons and stuff. It becomes mm. a whole professional thing. Yeah. Then it becomes a career. Mm. And when I lived in India, um, it was uh, I worked with Indian scientists. I was in an Indian sci uh, international scientific institute. Mm. Um, most of my Indian scientific colleagues had not gone into science because of a deep curiosity about nature. Mm. They'd gone into it because their parents believed in education yeah. and science and medicine and engineering were the three yes. top careers. Yeah. And, and so any bright children mm. had been pushed into that and mm. pushed in their studies and pushed mm. through mm. Uh, the university and then they, they got jobs in high prestige institutions mm. if they worked hard enough. Mm. Um, and their whole social status and the ability to marry off their daughters to more prestigious husbands in an arranged marriage system, it moved them up the social scale instead. It wasn't at all about curiosity for most of them. And I think for many scientists in, 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 uh, today here in Britain, it's not primarily about deep curiosity about nature. It's about being a functionary within a system. Well, as um, Whitehead said, this divorce between science and philosophy is, is, has been to the detriment of both. Mm. And I think that science, properly understood, is a, is, is a form of philosophy. It's an investigation of philosophy in certain particular empirical methods. Uh, but it has uh, philosophical implications and it draws on philosophical principles at its outset. It may not understand that it does that, yes. but that's more dangerous. When people don't realize what it is they're doing, they don't do it well. But I think that you know, we need to get back to the understanding that science is, has philosophical meaning and that this is not enough discussed. So one needs philosophically-minded scientists and 
scientifically minded philosophers, philosophers who are willing to you know, spend time learning about the science that will give them insights into the forming of their philosophy. Well, I mean, in, uh, here in Britain, the word science wasn't introduced until the 19th century. 1830s. And before yeah. that, it was called natural philosophy. Exactly. And, you know, Newton's great book, Principia Mathematica, mm. the, nat the mathematical principles of natural philosophy. Mm. Mm. Um, so, uh, I think that natural philosophy is actually a really good word and for mm. it. And I'm a member of the main Cambridge University Scientific Society, which is called the Cambridge Philosophical Society. Mm -hmm. Because when it was started in the early 19th century, mm -hmm. it, it, it was called Natural Philosophy as Cambridge. Mm -hmm. I s subscribed to the Biological Reviews, which was on the main review journals in biology, the subtitle is of the Cambridge Philosophical Society. Yeah. Um, so I think natural philosophy is what you are, I'd like to think it's what I and Alex are too, and I think yes. that probably most people who listen to us are natural philosophers. Mm. And mm. Um, and it's so, in a sense, it's a matter of recovering what was the root of what we now call science. Mm. Before, it was hijacked by, um, you know, this professionalization movement mm. and this mm. creation of this priesthood and mm. Um, mm. Uh, and making it an exclusive. Mm. professional organization that you ha that you have to obey the rules of one of the things i feel about the age we live in is the predominance of the administrative or bureaucratic mind over almost every aspect of our lives and i think this is deeply damaging and i think it's an exhibition of the left hemisphere's way of um both trying to understand but misunderstanding what it's dealing with and above all to control it and I think that what has happened is that, yes, I understand the analogy with the church, but the, what has really happened is that something much less glamorous has happened in science, which is simply that it's become a huge bureaucracy. It has uh, money uh, to spend, which, it, which follows um, people who tow the party line, do more of what everyone else is doing, and it's very difficult in this sclerotic um, hierarchy as it would be in the middle of an enormous Byzantine civil service to be able to mm. break out and see something else or do something else. So I think the future will depend on the development of small private colleges where people are very much, um, you take in only the brightest people. I think that's very important. We're, we're, we're sort of worried by the concept of elitism, but mm. looked at another way. Education depends on, and our future depends on, people who have the capacity to think clearly and to think imaginatively being encouraged. And that's what a good college should be doing, in my view. And so I think it's from those uh, small institutions which are beginning to spring up in competition with the with the great universities that the future will flourish uh, and I'm, I'm sorry about that because I have a great allegiance uh, for the enormously interesting and, and valuable history of our great institutions I'm very sorry to say this but they're beginning to turn themselves into something that can be easily dispensed with mm. How to prevent those institutions from following the same path and also how to solve the accreditation problem there because in a way, that, that I wanted to ask you both this mm. very question, like, you have navigated outside the institutional seas, mm. but nevertheless there's some appreciation for institutions still mm. in mm. both mm. of you. And so oh, I wonder very much for the so, future, yes. how much of mm. it can we still embrace and how much we need to just reject. So these, these back to the future, these future scientists mm. and philosophers, mm. are they going to be in institutions? And if they're not, how is the new order or the new business go going to be in terms of accreditation and, and so on? It's like, um, it's like designing a, um, uh, a new Atlantis, a new, new Atlantis, you know? What's the mm -hmm. new, new Atlantis uh, <laughs> 400 years later? Well, I don't have a crystal ball, I don't no. know. But, but I think that what you say 
in the sense that there needs to be an institution, but it may not be these institutions, I think is right. I mean, everything evolves, and evolution is partly that things have their proper period, and the, the great universities, Oxford and Cambridge, for example, you know, have a thousand-year history. They're currently committing suicide, in my view, by not sticking to their guns. Um, and uh, so this means that um, other institutions will spring up because there's a natural need to n nourish those who will benefit from being given freedom and discipline together and the time to fulfill these things. I, 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 let me tell, me tell you something about my own experience, which, which, which will sound horribly, you know, I don't know, unusual, but I, I got this fellowship at 21 of All Souls, and I was to embark on a doctorate on um, 18th century English literature. And this fellowship was a seven-year fellowship after examination. There's this strange thing that doesn't have any equivalent at Cambridge or anywhere else in Oxford, of a, of a college that consists only of fellows, not of any students, graduate or otherwise. And when you become a fellow after examination, which is a three-day examination, if you become one, you get seven years in which to do whatever it is that interests you intellectually. And uh, Derek Parfit, a, a very well-known philosopher, said to me, don't do your doctorate, anybody can do a doctorate, that's part of the sort of machinery, but you've been given something completely extraordinary, which is seven years in which you can pursue ideas. And I thought he was absolutely right, and at the time I followed all kinds of interests in science, in other languages, in literature, in philosophy, and at the time I thought, you know, this is wonderful, but I didn't realise until much later in my life why it had been so important. And I'm not sure that even, I, I don't know enough, I mustn't speak about what I'm not certain of, but I think that the, the ethos at All Souls has rather changed, as everything does, and there's more of that, you know, we must keep an eye on what he's reading and has he published a paper and all that. But I was free of that. And, and later in life I thought, well, what did I make of that? And to me, the answer came with the publication of these books, because I couldn't possibly have written them unless I'd been allowed to range wild, as you say, mm. <laughs> over the, but I did it within an institution, mm. over the fields of things from which I drew the bigger picture I've tried to express in these books, which can only be done if you've had the ability to range. So this business of range, which is exactly the opposite of the tendency towards ever greater specialism, is very, very important. And I think that more institutions ought to follow what happened in the 60s, which was, you know, um, uh, institutions uh, used to take people that had proved themselves to be intelligent and give them carte blanche. And you know, they gave them an office, gave them a, you know, an income for a few years and then said, follow your instincts, you know, mm. what, what you find interesting. And out of that came many, many inventions. Well, I had a very similar um, period of freedom to you and actually I feel enormously grateful for it. And I had As two I periods of freedom. I, first of all, when I was an undergraduate at Cambridge, I became increasingly disenchanted with mechanistic science, mm. which I was studying. Mm. I had started reading Goethe, and I had the idea of a holistic science. And I just everyone assumed I'd go on and do a PhD because I got a double first and that yes. kind of thing. So, um, but I wasn't sure if I wanted to. I mean, I liked science, but I didn't like killing animals all the time, and I didn't like the trying, treating them as machines and the whole attitude of mechanistic science. So I found there was this uh, fellowship at Harvard that was open to people from Cambridge for a year in the graduate school. I applied for it and I got it. And when I got to Harvard to do history and philosophy of science, to step back to see the bigger picture, that's what I wanted to do. Um, I found that they treat graduate students at Harvard um, in a way I hadn't been treated since I, since I was about 15. You know, read these pages this week, read this and we'll test you to make sure you've read. It was spoon feeding, there was no freedom. Okay. I tried doing what they said <laughs> and after about a month I, I just couldn't do it. I mean I, you'd have to stay up till midnight every night to read all this stuff and they test you. There was no time to read anything else, to study anything else that interested you. It was completely on, on a track. Mm -hmm. but, 
So I went to see the professor of history of science who was in charge of me, and I said, look, I love being here at Harvard, and I'm really interested in these subjects, but this isn't the way I learn, and this isn't the way I work, and I don't really need a master's degree from Harvard, because I can buy one from Cambridge, it's only <laughs> five pounds. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, in those days, you could all you had to do was stay alive for three and a third years and pay five pounds, and you got a master's degree. Yes. If you got a bachelor's, same at Oxford, I Same at Oxford, yeah. <laughs> so presumably you bought yours, too, or yeah. maybe you didn't bother. Yes, it, it came to me automatically. I don't think I had to pay. Oh, yes, I had to pay five pounds. <laughs> yes. so, uh, so I said to the professor, I, I just don't need your master's degree. Um, and uh, he said, are you sure? And he said, it's a Harvard master's degree. And I said, well, I'm quite sure. I'll get a Cambridge one. And, uh, um, <laughs> and I said, is there any way I can just be here for a year and be part of the university and not do all these exams <laughs> and tests and things? I said, I think that would be much more useful and valuable for me. He said, well, actually, we do have a rarely used provision called special students. And he said, uh, but, you know, and I said, well, can you make me one? And he said, well, I'd have to talk to the committee and stuff. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. Anyway, I got him to register. They, they agreed, and I was registered as a special student. So I was there in the graduate school at Harvard. I was doing a bit of teaching to earn a bit of money in the natural sciences program in the biology labs in Biology 101. I was teaching lab classes. But otherwise, apart from my obligation to do that, I had complete freedom. I went to lectures in history of art, and mm. philosophy, mm. in classics, mm. In, mm. In, you know, in, in history. Um, yes. I, I had the entire. I got the university catalogue, and I went through the list of lectures every yes, week. Yes. And and I did a lot of philosophy and history of yes. science. But mm. I, I had an entire university at my disposal, and you know, and when everyone else was doing exams, I just caught the train to New York and had. Uh, 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 fun in New York for a few <laughs> days. So it was the most blissful way of being at a university. Mm. And then later, when I got my fellowship at Clare College in Cambridge, it started as a research fellowship. Mm. And it was a, I had a six year research fellowship where my teaching load was limited to six hours a week mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. tutorials. And since in Cambridge, like Oxford, the vacations last six and a half months a year. Mm. This is only six hours a week for five and a half months a year. And actually less than that because half a month is exam. So it's a, it was not exactly an onerous teaching burden. It was the nicest form of teaching two students at a time mm. informally in tutorials. Um, and the rest of the time I was completely free. I didn't mm. even, I don't think I even wrote annual reports. Mm. Then I got a research fellowship from the Royal Society and I did have to write a one-page annual report. But I was completely free in what I inquired into. Mm. And when I said to the college, you know, I've just got this thing from the Royal Society, who wrote a tropical research grant, and I'm going off to the University of Malaya for a year to study rainforest plants and traveling through India on the way. Uh, they said, well, fine, you know, so I, I, it was an incredible period. For me, mm. laid the foundation for everything I've done since. So, mm. like you, I was given an extraordinary freedom within yeah. an institutional framework, yes, yes. Um, which was vastly valuable. Yes. Now, very, very few people have that opportunity. Absolutely. And, and you know, what I want to emphasize is, I, like, like you, I think it's very important. Like you, I feel very grateful for having been given it. My worry is that it won't be given in the future to many people, but I think it's important. We live in an er era of micromanagement, and I think micromanagement produces only mediocrity. If you're constantly controlling and dictating what people read and think, you will only get mediocrity yes. and that if you give people a degree of freedom okay there's a risk that they will abuse it and they won't come up with something but it's it's a much smaller risk than the risk of micromanaging them which ensures that they will never come up with anything interesting mm. so you actually have to in a way trust and give time to to people to explore things that are of interest to them otherwise it's the death of the life of the mind
Mm -hmm. And it's for this reason that so many, uh, as we both know, in, in the past, so much of the science of the 18th and 19th century and even into the 20th century, um, comes from the work of of priests, or, or of vicars, of monks. I mean, Mendel was a monk. Yes. <laughs> um, they weren't part of any particular mainstream, but they they had the security of a place, and they were allowed to think and observe and ask f interesting questions. Why do pea plants work in this way? Yeah. Well, I think one simple way this could be achieved with the stroke of a pen is mm. is simply changing the name of unemployment benefit to research grants. <laughs> 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 uh, so then we could have lots and lots of people on research grants and the stigma of being on unemployment benefit <laughs> uh, would be transformed, at least for some people. Yes, very um, nice. Um, mm. Because we, after all, have a lot of people who are economically idle, mm. as mm. it were, in the classification yes, of governments, yes, yes. who are actually being paid by the state. Yes. Um, and so much of that could be repurposed. I mean, mostly yes. people are disempowered by being unemployed. Yes. But if this could be seen as a, as a positive thing, and also, well, uh, 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 and also another uh, idea that it's mm. only academics really that have sabbatical years, mm. which is supposed to be mm. a year in which you can enjoy the kind of freedom we're talking about, mm -hmm. to be refreshed and, and, mm. and so on. Um, and so another scheme would be to make sabbatical years optional for everybody. So when you're 40 or 50 or 60 mm. or something, you could take an optional sabbatical year mm. and you'd cut, take a cut in income. You'd have mm. to take leave from your regular job and you'd get the unemployment benefit, which mm. would now be redesignated a research grant <laughs> or a sabbatical grant. Um, it wouldn't cost the state any more because mm. they're paying lots of anyway, people not yes, to work anyway. Yes. And by empowering people who are not working in regular jobs mm. to think of themselves as doing something different. I mean. It could be voluntary work, it could be natural mm. history, it could mm. be scientific research, it could be, there could be small grants for people on sabbaticals to set up experiments in their garages and, and stuff. I mean, there could be, it could fuel a whole wealth of invention throughout the population. I'm sure you're right. Al almost no extra cost. And, and one thing I know from experience is that in the few cases where I've learnt a practical skill, that it has been enormously satisfying, probably more satisfying than almost anything else. Mm. Um, and so encouraging people not just to feel demoralised and not have any goal, it might be better to allow people to train, uh, to develop a skill, which, which is a very life-enhancing thing and useful to society. Yes. So there's not enough skilled labour. One's always looking for people who can do this or that or the other. And uh, maybe that should be part of the, the scheme as well. Mm. There's already government schemes, you know, for people in area deprived areas of okay. economically to, for yes. retraining. Yes. There's already retraining grants. Yes. But if those, I mean, I haven't looked into how they're administered, but I imagine that, that, mm. that if one got into the details of existing bureaucracy and existing grant structures, mm. some of it could be repurposed and, or revisioned in a way mm. that's along the lines you're yes, suggesting. Yes. I mean, some of it's intended for that. Yes, yes. And, and uh, so I think that within the present system, there's probably quite a lot of potential for revisioning these parts of what people can learn and do. So drawing things together, perhaps, I mean, there's a need to to break out of the straitjacket of, you know, these people are unemployed and therefore just waiting to get back into this horrible machine. Mm. But there is life outside the machine. There are other things that can be developed for all of us, depending on what is, what is both practical for us and, and, and enjoyable for us to develop. And it's about abandoning this micromanaging uh, administrative approach to education, to science, uh, and allowing people to develop the skills that they have innately. In other words, education should be a matter of growing things, not inserting things. Um, and at the moment, it's mainly about inserting things. Mm. Mm. But it's interesting, you see, one of the things that's happening at the moment is the so-called skills shortage or employment shortage. Mm. That there's, you know, I read an article just yesterday, uh, there's the mystery of why that we have low, very low 
uh, unemployment at the, at the moment in Britain. Mm. Um, and yet you can't get people to do jobs, uh, mm. but, it, but there's large numbers of people who are economically inactive. Yes. And so I, most people in Britain assume the skills shortage or labour shortage is because of Brexit, mm -hmm. no uh, yes. immigration mm. from Europe. But um, there's a very similar, when we were in Canada in the summer, they have the same situation there in Western mm -hmm. Canada. Mm -hmm. It's the same in the United States. It's the same. Uh, mm -hmm. And what seems to have happened is a large number of people have just voluntarily retired from the labor force mm -hmm. before retirement age. Mm. Simply can't be bothered to have a job. And that must mean a drop in income. Mm. But there's millions of people who Prepared are Prepared to take working. that rather than carry on. Yes. Well, what that tells you is that a lot of people's jobs are very unrewarding. Mm. Yes, and and I think what's really sad is that jobs that are in the past obviously rewarding, like being a teacher or a doctor. Um, I think people are probably not keen to. We know there's a shortage of doctors, there's a shortage of teachers, and I think that's partly to do with the way again a management culture has taken over from a professional culture, and the individual is no longer allowed to pursue interests and. It's entirely micromanaged, like the Harvard thing. Today you read these things, mm. and tomorrow you read those things. So we we need to stop this. I and mean, there was a, a wonderful moment of creativity early on in the COVID crisis when managers couldn't keep up with the situation, and doctors said, "Well, the hell with it. We're going to do what we think will work." And lots of things were experimented with, and some of them were successful, and some of them not. But this is a good situation. Is one in which doctors use their experience, are not told what to do by a manager who has no experience. Mm. Yeah, and in in closing, it's not Same only as teachers. Yeah. In and we talk about it but again let me say you both of you are examples that this can be done so I think it's it's useful <laughs> again to have the discussion but to show yes. that there are living examples and it's not easy but it's uh, it yes. can be done and hopefully more people in the future will I hope so yes be able to yes. mm. we've been very fortunate yes mm. very fortunate yeah both within and outside institutions yes. exactly mm. yeah all right good Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you, Alex. Thank you, Alex.